I'm ready. Hello, everybody. This is Joseph Matera, the National Convener for the United States Coalition of Apostolic Leaders. And I'm really excited that you've joined us today. And some of you are not going to watch this live. You'll participate afterwards or view it on social media. So we want to welcome you. Uh, United States Coalition of Apostolic Leaders, or USCAL, uh, can be found on uscal.us. You can check out our vision. You can check out upcoming events. And you can check out when the next roundtables are. So we try to do uh, a roundtable every quarter and uh, try to do something that's very relevant regarding the kingdom of God and what God is doing in the church place and the workplace. And so we're excited today uh, as we're going to be doing a roundtable with Alan Hirsch, and we're going to be dealing with the subject of the uh, missional apostolic movement, church movement. And uh, before we get rolling with Alan and, and we uh, introduce Alan and give him a, a, you know, a, a moment just to give a snapshot of his life and ministry, um, I wanted just to mention that we just had a great summit, a U.S. Cal Bridge Summit on June, uh, it was it June 11 to the 13th in Atlanta, and uh, just amazing, amazing three days. Uh, it was a bridge between young and older leaders, between the Word and the Spirit, between workplace and marketplace, between ethnicities, and uh, we were just excited to see what God did. There's just incredible momentum right now in our movement, and you can mark your calendar for next year, Bridge Summit 2019. It's going to be June 10th to the 12th in Sojourn Church in the Dallas, Texas area, so uh just mark that down in your calendar. Uh, and at some point, I'll, I'll mention the next roundtable. We try to do roundtable meetings with new video technology so that we can continue to connect, dialogue, participate, chat, and not depend just on annual gatherings. So we're thankful for this technology. Now, before we um, jump into this, let me just give a, a brief framework of the apostolic as we know it. Uh, from our perspective, what we're talking about is trying to go back to the New Testament pattern, uh, which not only planted churches, but movements, because it was made up of disciples who made disciples. And it was not a one-man show. It was a collective of many people that were working and flowing together. It took Jesus 12 people to take his place. And so in the one church, Jerusalem, uh, we had a centrifugal movement that went forth and discipled the world that uh, actually became a Jesus movement that affected every aspect of culture, uh, especially starting in Western culture. And we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, that Luke, referring back to his gospel said that his gospel was the beginning of what Jesus began to do and teach. By implication, this next narrative, that is to say the book of Acts, was what Jesus continued to do through his people. And Jesus made reference to that when he was preparing for his leaving. He told them that they would do greater works than him. It said in John 14, 12, and then he told them that it would be better for them that he would go away. Because if he goes away, he would send the, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit that empowered him, meaning Jesus, the same spirit that fell on the day of Pentecost. And that began the Jesus movement as we know it today, or the church. The church has gone through many different paradigmatic shifts. Uh, it went from a movement to an institution. It went from corporate to individualistic. Uh, it went from uh, a consensus movement of bishops, as we saw in the Nicene uh, Convention in uh, 325 AD, to a papal uh, theological movement where uh, it went from consensus theology to papal theology. Uh, and it, then it went uh, to fast forward. You know, we, we could spend many, many hours on church history going to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. It went back to a focus on scripture as opposed to just church tradition and doctrine. 
became a creedal confessional movement, uh, a bit still institutional, but they jettisoned the office of bishop, which was the historical uh, succession of the apostolic function. And uh, with that jettisoning of the, uh, what we would say, the, the office of the bishop became fragmentation because they, they didn't recognize that one leader leadership function in the church that held everybody together. That's why when the church in the East and West split, the church by and large stayed together. But once the Protestant Reformation came and they jettisoned the office of bishop and they only recognized pastor and teacher, especially John Calvin and others, and they went from corporate to more individualistic, there was incredible fragmentation that we see today. To this day now, there's about 30 to 40,000 denominations uh, some of them come from the roots of the uh, Roman Catholic paradigm. Some come trace their roots to the uh, to the uh, Orthodox or the Eastern Church. Uh, some trace their roots to the uh, Protestant Reformation, and then you have the revivalists of the 17th century, 18th century, and uh, most of evangelicalism has some kind of roots in that. And then you have the Holiness movement that arose out of the revivalistic movement and the Methodist uh, holiness movement, which then gave birth to Azusa Street and the Pentecostal movement in 1906. Um, and then we had a, an attempt to get back at the New Testament pattern with the latter rain movement of 1948, where they began recognizing the fivefold ministry. And uh, I'm working off the heels of that leading U.S. Cal and we're trying to continue to reform and continue to grow and progress and get to a point where some of the mistakes that the pioneers of the last 60 years who are trying to recapture uh, the New Testament pattern, uh, we're trying to further uh, bring um, a New Testament order and ethos by, by having certain earmarks that I think are more biblical that is to say, things like having servant leadership that is uh, highlighted uh, as opposed to top-down leadership. Instead of being title-driven, looking at apostolic as a function, as a description, as an adjective, instead of uh, trying to take cities, we want to serve cities. Uh, trying to lose some of the triumphalistic language and methodologies so there are many, many things that we're trying to do now in U.S. Cal. Um, and recently I got to meet Alan through a mutual friend who is the chairperson of the executive council for U.S. Cal. His name is Buford Lipscomb. He might even be on this round table. And he introduced me and Alan. He said that we think very similarly. I read his book on uh, uh, recovering the uh, old ways. And just an amazing, amazing book. I just, I said, man, me and him are like, we, we come from different angles, but we think the same. And I got to get to know this guy. And so Buford set up a video call. We got to meet. And I, I was just so impressed with Alan and his heart and the way he is moving in and out of evangelical movements. Uh, has a lot of influence in what we would call the missional church movement. And uh, I would say with his influence, it's becoming, because uh, I studied the missional church many, many years ago, and some of his writings are a lot more progressive and, to me, more New Testament pattern than, than what I'm used to seeing in, in my readings. And uh, I would say that Alan is, is probably more responsible than anybody else that I know for helping the whole evangelical church begin to think through going from twofold ministry to fivefold to embracing apostolic paradigms going from pastoral to an apostolic paradigm which is essential if we are going to evangelize and serve and disciple nations um, and so alan is here with us and without further ado i want alan just to give a greeting give us brief snapshot of his ministry many of you don't know him yet uh, and then after that, um, maybe Alan might want to share a few things off of what I said. And if not, I'm just going to ask him some questions and we're going to just do an interview. So, Alan, so good to have you with the U.S. Cal Roundtable. 
It's just an honor and a thrill to get to know you and meet someone of kin kindred spirit. And uh, man, just somebody uh, just uh, that, that I could relate to so much. So thank you, Alan, for being here. Thank you very much for having me, Bishop Matera. So yeah, good to be with you. Um, yeah, so uh, you want me to give a bit of information about myself, where I come from and all that stuff. So Yeah, yeah, and what your ministry is. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not from around these parts. So I'm living in LA at the moment, but um, yeah, I'm not from LA. You can hear that. Uh, I'm, I was born in South Africa, actually, uh, and uh, I see it as I escaped when I was about 22. I was born in a Jewish family, and so... Um, yeah, in, in apartheid, South Africa hated it, uh, needed to get out. Uh, so off we went to 22, actually my family with my family went over to Australia. Um, um, and I've been, an, you know, I'm an Australian citizen for the last 35 or so years. So I do consider myself an Aussie, but I, I don't live there right now. And so I don't even know where I'm from anymore. <laughs> I've been 10, 10 or 12 years now in, uh, in, uh, in America. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel I kind of belong to the kind of global church and I travel a fair bit. So I really honestly, am, I'm not sure where I'm from. Yeah. <laughs> those identities are those feed into me anyway. Um, I came to the Lord, uh, started being very, very drawn to Jesus at a very early stage as a Jewish kid. That's kind of a bit of a no, no, but I, I, I did feel that, you know, I was being drawn by God's grace and theologians call that prevenient grace and, I certainly experienced it. And when I was in there, I had to do military service, did a lot of marijuana to cope and uh, came to the Lord when, when probably the kind of the leader of our little smoker circle has this encounter with, with, uh, with Jesus one weekend comes back like on fire and, but he never left us. And he, you know, he introduces Jesus very explicitly into our little circle and, you know, and uh, for me, it was a trigger point and, and certainly beginning, beginning of a turning point. Eventually, I, 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 I went over to Australia, but I, you know, I had a huge encounter with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I mean, huge, uh, definitive experience where I still can't even describe today, uh, which turns me around and, you know, I, I set me on the whole thing of, of uh, you know, being, uh, you know, into, into ministry and leadership. Uh, I eventually ended up leading a, a church in inner city, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, we had a fair bit of renewal there and, you know, the, the church multiplied. We had church plants. Uh, we were in a very, very difficult part of the city, like a lot of poor and marginalized people, a lot of gay folk. Uh, and we were engaging quite, you know, qu quite a, a successfully with them and all that. So it became a bit of a model church. I was uh, recruited by my denomination, paying for my sins, which were many. And uh, did a number of years of that uh, side by side with my work uh, in the local city. Uh, developed a thing called Forge Mission Training Network, out of which many of my books, you know, is, uh, attempts to try and write curriculum for training people to be missionaries to the first world, you know, to the Western world primarily. That's my focus anyway. And so helping the established church in the West uh, become uh, a movement again has been the kind of key theme of my life. You know. So I think that's probably covers me. More or less. I've written about 12 books now. The book you're referring to was The Forgotten Ways, um, which is kind of the centerpiece work, which I think we're going to discuss a little later on. So. But I have about 12, 12 or so books. Yeah, so your theology arose out of being a practitioner, actually being on the ground, working with the hurting, the down and out, the uh, marginalized people. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, even though in my American experience, I, I haven't been a local practitioner, I've, I'm not an academic either. So, uh, I mean, I, I lecture on occasions at seminaries, but I'm, I'm really much more a kind of, I see myself as a translocal practitioner. Just just get around. I get around to just about every form of church in this country and beyond. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's really exciting. Well, the advantage of being like that is that you're writing out of experience out of things that could work instead of just being a swivel chair theologian who writes theoretically without having anything that's proven. So yep. um, could you talk about how practice is very, very important to inform our theology? Yeah, well, well actually, so, uh, you know, I, I believe this very much. In fact, like our, my, one of my primary organizations that I started 20 years ago uh, is called Forge Mission Training Network. 
And it was built on the assumption that we needed to um, move learning primarily from the classroom, which is, of course, the Western tradition trains people in classrooms, which basically is a very passive kind of form. And it follows the Hellenistic or the Greek understanding of the world, um, platonic. Uh, if you get the idea of something, uh, you get it. And the assumption is you can think your ways into new ways of acting right. Whereas in the Hebrew, you know, the Hebrew worldview would have it much more that you, it's, uh, that you act your ways into new ways of thinking. So action is really important. I mean, we can just see this in the way that Jesus, you know, disciples, his followers, you, you know, he calls them to be in kind of dynamic relationship with them. And then he, you know, it's this action learning. He sends them out sheep amidst the wolves and, says, you know, they have no idea what they're doing. I mean, they're just working it out. And then they come back and he instructs them. So it's this, you know, so I think that that's really, really important. And, uh, and, and trying to learn, uh, you know, I say like, you know, I, I love theology. I love kind of learning. I, I think my books are filled with kind of that kind of stuff. I love sociology to philosophy. But I think you take your books with you. And uh, I think the idea of being static, you know, four or five years in the classroom uh, doesn't make any sense of, of the biblical way of formation. It undermines discipleship. And I think that's a big, big issue in the, uh, in the, uh, the kind of the, it's a, it's a, a fatal flaw in the, in the life of the Western church. Yeah. Unfortunately, we went from the new Testament pattern to adopting the Greek Academy, mm -hmm. the Greek Academy methodology, individualistic learning ideas in a classroom, mm -hmm. uh, went against the Hebraic model of, of Jesus, the way of Jesus and the apostles. Yeah. You're a friend of Roland. You're a, a fan of Roland Allen as I well as I am. Allen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, when, we, when me and Alan talked, we, we couldn't believe how much similarity we had. Now thinking of her, uh, our mutual friend Buford called us twins. Uh, mm -hmm. Alan, more of a sort of like an evangelical uh, twin of me as a, a charismatic twin, even though we're both charismatic and evangelical. Um, yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, this movement from the Hebraic to the Hellenistic uh, has still imp implications, even the way we do seminary today, Bible school, Bible institutes, and the seminary, as far as I'm concerned, has failed to raise up by scale the amount of people that we need for leadership in the global church. So we have to start doing things differently. Um, Otherwise, we're going we're, we're gonna to have a lot of people saved, but there won't be enough disciples to disciple them. So uh, we definitely have to do something. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the work you're doing with groups like Exponential, Dave Ferguson, and others. How are you helping them think through the way of Christ and his teachings? Yeah, so... Um... Well, so part of my thing, as I mentioned, uh, is to uh, help the church uh, think uh, of itself and its functions through the lens of being a missionary agency in the Western world again. So uh, we've often treated mission as something we do overseas um, in two-thirds world or majority world contexts, uh, and that we adopt a certain methodology in those contexts, which actually is cross-cultural, it's sensitive to the uh, conditions of culture uh, and to translate the gospel in ways that are meaningful language being a one example, but more than language, we should be finding new forms of church and all that. And, uh, you know, I think we kind of worked that out a little bit in missional thinking over the years. Um, the really what the missional church movement seeks to do is to try and uh, bring those learnings back into the Western church, uh, which is built on assumptions that everyone, you know, in the Christendom period, everyone was considered Christian. You know, unless you were Jewish or, or maybe a gypsy or something like that. But, uh, you know, most people were baptized into the faith, whether you liked it or not. So they didn't need, they didn't think they needed mission, right? So the church was just there as part of the kind of national identity and national culture and civilization. So, you know, most of our awareness of mission dropped out of, of church. We didn't see church as a missionary agency. And so one of the big things I try and do is to help churches think as if they were a mission agency. What does it mean to kind of engage in, in, in contemporary contexts where, you know, the whole cultural thing has shifted on us? I mean, you live in New York City, one of the most diverse cities in the world. And, you know, you, you simply, you know, 
you, you simply can't engage that context on the assumptions that we've inherited down the line in the Western tradition. I, I often think of it this way, Joseph, uh, that, um, you know, we, we've, we've inherited an understanding of the church and its relationship to the context uh, from, uh, from, the, uh, from the Reformation in our case, but inherited down the Western tradition. Uh, um, but it's like, you know, and now we live in, uh, in a, a completely different set of s- social and cultural conditions. I mean, it's completely different. The French Reformation changed everything. It, it secularized society. The church was pushed to the edges. I, I think that's actually probably where we should be, you know. We're not meant to be telling everyone else what to do. Uh, we're very, very badly behaved when we do that. Uh, and, <laughs> I mean, you mentioned the, all that papal stuff. It really came out of that assumption that we had the right to tell everyone what to do. We should be a witnessing community, right? We should be transforming, not dominating, you know? So, so anyway, all that to say, um, so here's the metaphor is like we're trying to negotiate New York City with a map of London or Geneva or, you know, wherever our model of church comes from. You know? So, and, and it just doesn't work, you know? We, we, so we have to really think very carefully about ourselves and how we engage now. It's a paradigm shift, you, you mentioned paradigms. And, so I help in that way. And also uh, one of the key things in, in my life is, uh, and I feel this is God tapped me on the shoulder many, many years ago and really became the content of the forgotten ways was that it was to try and understand what factors make for dynamic movement. Uh, what things have got to come together to catalyze transformative, exponential, high impact movements of Jesus' people. And so, you know, um, so I help anyone who wants to go the movement way. Exponential is one of them, you know, so it's just a big conference that does church planting training. So, yeah. yeah. Right. So, um, in other words, to collapse it down to something very, very brief, if we were to act as a mission agency, then what the church would do would define its essence by its mission, not just and start with mission, yeah. as opposed to making mission just a part of yes. their community. Can yes. you just elaborate on that? Yes. Can I use a whiteboard? I'm much better with a whiteboard. Sure. So it'll just kind of just dominate this thing, but just I'll kick it in here. So one of the, uh, the, the great challenges, uh, uh, is, uh, if I may take, you know, I'll explain something here. There was a, a gentleman called Ralph Winter, who was a missiologist training people to go cross-cultural. Uh, in, you know, so he was training missionaries cross-culturally. And he developed this tool called uh, a cultural distance, cultural distance. And what he did there is he put it on line, or zero to four, and one, two, three, four. And what he suggested that each number indicates a significant barrier to the meaningful communication of gospel, right? So if I said, you know, to a group of people, what do you think would be a significant barrier to the meaningful communication of the gospel? Everyone says language, right? Uh, so you can say language is one. Uh, but if you, another significant barrier would be people's race uh, or their story, their, their, their history, their racial identity, you know, where did that come from and how is that formed? Another one would be religion or worldview. The problem in, uh, in, in this, as I've mentioned, is that we've, got a, we've inherited understanding of the church. It looks kind of like that. And it was formulated in a time when we were in M0, M1 context. So most of the ways we operated and the way we thought of ourselves was within this. There was no significant cross-cultural thing needed. Uh, and if you, you, just really evangelism and outreach, that's about all you need. The, so the problem is that now we live in a world, New York City, and I'm in Los Angeles, but someone in, Georgia, you know, in Atlanta, the whole thing has gone shifted in that direction on us, you know, moved towards it. Now we have like in our neighborhoods, people that are, quite distant from God and culturally uh, far, you know. So we have to develop a whole different methodology here than the one we have over here. And so that, that's one of the challenges that we have to, uh, to do. And so, you know, that's, that's a different way of thinking because what works over here, where we used to, won't work over here. That, that we're quite clear about too. So this, this here is a shrinking kind of phenomenon. Every year is less and less uh, of that available to us. But most of our methodology and most of our thinking is form- formatted for that kind of setting. 
So that's a major challenge which we're facing at the moment. Just one of them, but it just it relates to what you're asking. Right, and that's what also differentiates us from just trying to get people in a building uh, and do a missional contextual or incarnational work. Yeah. Uh, I studied with Ray Bakke, who was probably the world's leading missiologist, urbanologist. Uh, he was my theological mentor from the early 90s. And he taught us to not only exegete scripture, but exegete a community. Can, yep. you, can you comment on that? How do you exegete yeah, a community? So, well, uh, one of the ways uh, to do that, I mean, is uh, say like at Forge, for instance, part of the methodology, if you're going among a people group in your own city now that are uh, distant from you, don't speak your, your language or, or come from a different subculture, which thinks differently to yours, um, we suggest this, that you don't know the answer to these questions before you get there. So there's two fundamental questions that, that, that we need to resolve. Um, one is, what is good news for this people group, right? What's going to sound like, yes, you know, you know, something that resonates with them. And now you really don't know that answer until you've listened to the, 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 the things that they're dealing with as a group and as a culture. Uh, and uh, how do, what's their search and, 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 and what would salvation, what would, what would really good news sound like to them? And we need to appropriate elements of the gospel that relate to that. So the first thing for, for, uh, for a missionary is to listen. Uh, interestingly, the guy who invented the stethoscope said this, listen, listen, listen to your patients. They're telling you the answer, right? And I think that's the first thing. So the, the first one is listen, uh, what is good news for this people group? And you, to do that, you've got to, you know, you've got to be around. You've got to speak to them. You've got to read their books. You've got to listen to what they're listening. You've got to try and grapple with what are the existential or the religious issues that they're dealing with. Second question is, what is what does church look like for this people group? And we know that the church uh, in, in a different culture ought to look different. I mean, we don't all have to be like Jerusalem, right? I mean, that was the whole thing of the Jerusalem Council. Uh, is that they, they, it wasn't a prefabricated church that was based on the Jerusalem model that, that was then imposed upon the rest of the world. Uh, the church in Corinth looked very different from the church in Thessalonica, looked different from the church in, you know, in Jerusalem. While there might be common features or what we call marks or characteristics that set it off as a church, nonetheless, they are going to be contextually different. And so we need to learn what, what that kind of uh, church planting that, doesn't impose a prefabricated understanding of the church on the people, but allows us to look at how do people gather? Why do they gather? What's the energy? What, what's the timing? Where do they gather? You know, and, and try and impose, you know, try and plant the church in where people are already at rather than just doing it on a Western Sunday church based model. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's absolutely vital. And that's the difference between being a faithful witness or presence in a community and just uh, launching missiles from a building and trying yeah. to get people's attention. Yeah. Um, can you Which, speak by the way, to... yeah, I mean, and, the, and the thing about that, uh, as you and I know, is that, you know, for most churches now, I mean, in America, for instance, uh, you know, that M0, M1, where you can do that kind of thing, because people all understand it, more or less, you're in the same kind of zone together. The problem is that that's all the low hanging, hanging fruit have now been picked largely by mega churches or, uh, you know, the kind of contemporary churches pretty much taken all the fruit down off the tree. So smaller churches are now struggling. And also we're also having to learn to climb the tree to get the fruit. And that's what I think the challenge is. We don't know how to climb the tree to get the fruit. We want it all on, on, the, on the terms of the inherited model. And that's a mistake, but yeah, sorry, brother. Well, and the challenge is, too, the difference between the typical missionary is that, you know, I could learn, uh, you know, three years of uh, a native culture and their language and go to Africa, go to Russia, go to uh, Czechoslovakia. But in an urban context like New York City, I can't just learn one community because my community is multi-ethnic, multicultural, multi-generational. Yeah. So... And my community, quite frankly, is reinventing itself every 10 years because of gentrification yes. or because mm. of refugees or because of uh, immigration. Mm. Uh, in New York City, in a complex 
society like that, uh, every 10 years, the demographics are changing with yes. e ethnicity and generations and economic values. Mm -hmm. It's not just ethnicity. It's not just skin color. It's not just religion. Now it's economic as well. Yeah. So that's yeah. where the sociology and, is important. Yeah. And demographics, which I mean, goes down to, to youth and youth, youth subcultures. And, you know, right. in, in, where I live, you've got the surfers, you've got the skaters, you've got the you know, various kind of music based subcultures. I mean, youth, youth subculture alone, youth is a subculture, but within youth broader culture, there's maybe hundreds of subcultures, which, you know, you have to be sensitive to, you can't assume that, you know, if you really want to meet them on their terms where the gospel ought to meet them, you have to pay attention to their culture because culture is how people receive and share meaning. Uh, and if you can't speak in culturally dynamic ways, you, you basically become a shouter, what you just say, a heckler, which actually doesn't really help the cause of the gospel very much. No, not at all. And uh, in a place as, as complex as New York City, LA, um, we, if we were stagnant just for five years, we would already be irrelevant. Because yeah. uh, it's... When we first started, our main demographic was Puerto Rican, Dominican, and uh, Norwegian. And Norwegian. now the main the demographic is Asian uh, and Mexican. Wow. So if we fell asleep at the wheel, we wouldn't have a church yeah. right now. Yeah. I think it's, you know, just, you know, I know that's challenging. A lot of people find that very hard. But actually, one of the things that's good about that for us is that mission uh, – if it's an organizing principle of the church, and I think it is, it's meant to be something which we organize around. It's got to be factored in at a, as a strategic priority. What it does do, particularly if you're taking context seriously, what I call incarnational mode, it, it means that we've got to constantly be innovative. We've got to be learning how to we express this in better terms. We can always improve on the way we express, express the gospel and we express our love of God's people. Uh, and we love a God in community. So there's, these ought to be adapting constantly to context because it just makes us, be, it just makes us better at, at, at the gospel, you know? So it's, a, it's kind of like, I think it's a blessing in disguise, although I think New York City is particularly complex. And you're right, it changes so radically. Um, that's, that's not the easiest, but not everyone lives in, in that kind of, those hyper-complex conditions. Right. Yeah, you know, when I go to different parts of the world, it's it's amazing when I see a homogeneous culture uh, as opposed to what I'm used to. Yeah. So there's not many left in in many ways. I mean, it doesn't matter if you go out east as well. They like, now very very mixed, you know, mixed Asian cultures mixing in with Asian cultures. It's the world is definitely changing in this regard. Yeah, yeah. Well, can you imagine if you were a pastor in Harlem 20 years ago and you left and you came back to Harlem, New York yeah. today? you would yeah. be totally shocked. And yeah. so the, the churches out there have had to adapt. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just quite amazing. Um, uh, but I, I do, like you, I find it exciting. It's a challenge. I think that a practitioner who's going to be a missiologist uh, and have a missional church movement has to be a cultural anthropologist. You know, anthropology has to be part of what we do. We have to study human nature, human movement, human demographics. Yes, we have to understand the culture, the ethos, and it can't just be an us against them mentality. It has yes. to be well. We look at the city as a gift to the church. It's not just the church as a gift to the city. Yeah, and we have to walk in humility and celebrate the humanness in everybody. And if they're not saved, we have oh. to understand that everybody, when they're born, whether they're of our affiliation, whether they're of our lifestyle or belief system or not. Everybody deserves dignity mm. as, as an image bearer of God. And so yeah. because everyone's an image bearer of God, there's always a key to unlock yeah. every heart yeah. and every culture. Absolutely Can you right. speak to that? Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm writing on, on that little key to culture at the moment, uh, to the human heart. Yeah, no, it's absolutely right. So like, uh, you know, um, every human being, as you say, is, 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 a, is a God bearer. And actually, for one thing it does to change us uh, in, in, in is, 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 you know, often like, again, in our inherited ways of thinking, certainly down, you know, the more reformed line or, but not exclusively, we tend to think of, uh, we tend to think of people as kind of, you know, first and foremost as sinners, you know, 
if you ask most people, what do you think? Oh, they're sinners, right? And the, the truth is we are. Uh, but that's a secondary truth, right? And the, the primary truth is that we're made like God. We're made in the image of God. We reflect or image him. And, uh, and if we just allowed ourselves to see the primary truth, and yes, yeah, acknowledge that, you know, there's a secondary truth here. But, but we can look at people very differently. Um, and and, and, and in Jewish theology, there's this kind of this idea that, that every, uh, all created things contain the sparks of holiness or the potential for it. And that one of the challenges and one of the, the uh, attributes of good deeds is that they liberate the holy sparks that are inherent in people and things and, and allow the spark you know, to, to, to join with the Shekinah. You know, there's the parts of the Shekinah. So it's a kind of interesting image of how we can fan into flames, you know, in people's lives, you know, the, uh, the connections that, 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 um, that bring them to God. I mean, um, it's interesting, um, you know, people doing things we might kind of consider sinful often are looking for the right thing in the wrong places. So it was, uh, GK Chesterton, kind of like the C.S. Lewis of Catholics, a very smart man. He said this, um, that the man knocking on the door of a brothel is looking for God, to which everyone goes, <gasps> but I would just, if we stopped and thought about that for a little while to say, what's really being sought when someone pays for sex? Well, you know, beyond the sinful side of it, it's, a, it's, it's wanting to be touched perhaps, or to experience a moment of ecstasy apart from the misery of existence. Uh, it could be loneliness, uh, now, these, those issues are real human issues. Now, what that person in going to uh, a brothel is actually trying to fulfill real human issues, but doing it wrongly. And so much sin is that. Uh, uh, when a person takes drugs, we judge it, and rightly, it's a dangerous, stupid thing to do. Uh, and, uh, but, but what's really being sought, and a lot of people, why they do drugs is because they they, they do can't cope with life and you know they're trying to escape from life or they want to party which is the the search for ecstasy or joy uh now those ecstasy and joy and uh, uh and and overcoming pain are real human issues yeah they're looking for the right thing in the wrong places lewis c.s lewis says all our vices of virtues gone wrong and so we need to i think we just need to look again as to what what is really being sought and just if people think this is all very strange and all that, I, I would suggest that we need only look in the book of Acts where you have the case of a Paul in Athens and a Paul in Jerusalem later on, I think Acts 20. Uh, in Jerusalem, he is doing what we would expect. He's got his big King James Bible out and he's doing line by line and precept by precept, you know, like a good Baptist, right? Uh, because he's, he's, he's preaching to the people who know the story. And, and so, and he can bring them to the gospel through the kind of recollection of the story of God through, through people's lives. If you look at Paul in Athens, which is a completely different place, doesn't have, it's not part of the story. He starts with three things, actually. He looks at their poetry, which is an art form. And all art is a search for meaning. If it's good, great art. Poetry particularly. In fact, the word for poet in the ancient world is prophetess, someone who speaks more than what they know. And, and, and I've found that artists are natural, you know, prophetically inclined people. Uh, 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 you know, so it starts with their poetry and the art form and, and he reads their philosophers uh, and, and he's able to quote that. And what is particularly interesting, he looks at their religion and uh, which is the idolatry. And he points out in this particular case, scholars, you know, uh, pin, think they pinned it down uh, that the name of the God he's referring to, the idol there, I see you're very religious, uh, is the, uh, the God series, um, where we get our word serial from. It's the, what they call the corn king. And why does, does Paul grapple with this is because actually it was the dying and rising image in, in the corn, the seed that goes into the ground that then brings forth new, new kind of ears of corn every year that it, 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 it multiplies. And really in that form already, in the, in, even in Greek idolatry, was a search for God that he could see the pattern 
of of Christ and the resurrection. And C.S. Lewis played a lot on that stuff too, in uh, huge amounts. But uh, I'm rambling now. But the point being is that there are keys in culture that we need to pay attention to and understand that the gospel addresses more than just our need for forgiveness and more than just our guilt. It addresses our problems of shame, our powerlessness, our grasping, our, you know, the other things that we struggle with as well. Okay. Yes, and that's why in terms of understanding redemption and the, the finished work of Christ, we also have to understand there's an element of restoration yeah. of humanity, of the Genesis 1 yeah. restoration from the Genesis 3. Yes. Yeah. Uh, could you speak to that a bit? Yes, well, I mean, like, isn't it like partly what was lost in the fall is re reclaimed in, in salvation? I mean, of course, it's only, you know, when Jesus comes again, it's nice and complete. But, yeah, that's what we're living into now, isn't it? The kingdom reality that was started in Jesus. And we, the people who live in that kingdom now, the restored ones, you know, we're brought into right relationship with God. And we live in, you know, with correct proportion to things, you know, like, you know, where Jesus is Lord and we know how to relate to each other because of Jesus is Lord. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and so we can work. I, I just quoted the other day in a Twitter. Um, I'd forgotten, you know, you write things, as you know, and then you forget you write them. But, you know, our Father, our Heavenly Father is a Redeemer. He loves to, you know, work among the broken. He likes to restore. You know, that's what He does. I mean, you look all the way, one of the beautiful images of salvation is God's restoring capacities, that He's a uh, Redeemer. He, he, and that's who He is, you know. And I said, if we were true to our born-again nature, that we are born again into his likeness and we're to imitate the Father as beloved children, then, you know, we too will be into restoring things. And, you know, whether or not everyone professes faith in Christ immediately, we, we don't, that's not our business. That's the Holy Spirit's business. We can go about fixing things. Uh, Again, uh, you know, I come from a Jewish background, as you know, and the Jews have a great image for this. It's called Tikkun Olam, or the repair of the universe. And they see that the things that we do to restore, heal, and repair the universe, that human action can, has, a, has a huge consequence. And I think it's very biblical, and I think it's what Jesus did, and we follow in his way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In my studying of different traditions and church history, I found that the Eastern Church really focuses on the restoration. The healing, of, yeah, the healing and yeah. restoration aspects of the atonement. Right, right. As, as, as opposed to, let's say, the Reformed, it's focusing on the uh, original sin, Catholic yeah. as well, yeah. Yeah. Roman Catholic, original sin, yeah. moral depravity. And we see yeah. this aspect. So that's why it's so beneficial to study the different traditions. Yes. And uh, we get some of the riches of, of the fullness of the redemption yeah. from understanding. Yeah. If I can play on that a little bit, because I think this, yeah. could, this plays right into what we're talking about here. This, uh, you know, um, missiologists have tried to argue this or try to work this out. I think this is correct. Um, that uh, they are, you know, if you think of like historically, the Western world has been more interested in right and wrong, uh, or you might say truth and untruth. You know, that's been our concern. So most Western philosophy uh, and ethics. Uh, that's what their concerns are. So guilt and, and all that stuff. In the East, uh, if you go out to the Middle East and then further out East, it's been shame and honor. That's the big deal there, shame and honor. You know, face and uh, whether you've di dishonored or shamed the family and, you know, it's all about, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and down South, generally, it's power. And there's two ways of saying this is power powerlessness. So who's got the power and who doesn't, but you can also call it power fear that, um, you know, there's, there's often an awareness of, uh, of, uh, of spiritual realities. And there's also, you know, people suffer under power. So a lot of the issues in, in Africa, you know, you, it's often the people oppress them, the leaders oppress them. It's all about power powerlessness. Now, why I say this is that what's happened in, you know, the last, 50 years particularly, is that in the West, we're dealing with much more, you know, a mixed base of all these things, you know. So if you look at Black, uh, Black Lives Matter, for instance, or, or the Me Too movement, it's dealing with this and this. But the, most times when we in the Western, again, in following the Calvin and the Reformed model, we try and resolve 
problems of shame and honor or dishonor with, uh, you know, guilt and righteousness. And it doesn't fit. It's kind of, it's not the aspect of the gospel that deals with that. And, uh, um, you know, I think a lot of people in America struggle with, with shame and honor, honor issues. I mean, it's a huge issue. Um, for instance, uh, Americans are very competitive. Uh, so are Australians, by the way, but uh, maybe the equally so. Uh, but the problem is with a, creating a competitive culture, you create one winner. Guess what? There's 100,000 losers to the one, one winner, right? And everyone else is a loser. And that begins to define how people see themselves. Uh, and, and, and America is very much a you know, winner-loser culture. Or when you create a standard of beauty, then you create ugly, ugliness, don't we? And all of us are ugly by comparison. So shame is an internal register. It's how we understand ourselves internally to what we, and we fail to live up to that. That's one of the aspects of shame. Uh, and, and you can't deal with that with forgiveness of sins because it's not a sin. And the, the way we deal with that is aspects of God's gospel that deal with unconditional love and grace and the fact that God raises up the downcast and brings down the prideful. That's gospel, man. But it's just a different type of gospel than the one we used to. Anyway. Mm. Wow, that's yeah. fantastic. Love that. I love that. Is that shown in any of your books uh the one i'm coming uh, uh i'm publishing at the moment be out in a little while but i'll tell you what there's a very good book that covers the issue of shame and honor uh it's called the global gospel uh the global gospel uh and it's written by a guy called Werner mishkin i'll write i'll write his name in this list here it's very simple uh and you, he's got a great um He's got a great website where he's got a, some free stuff on there that make you, you know, and then there's a whole lot of stuff about shame on it. I think we need to understand this uh, uh, as well, I think you sense as well, because uh, it, it, it means that we have to reformat how we articulate the gospel in Western context to deal with, you know, so many things that people are dealing with in our day. Wow. And uh, the global gospel is written by Werner. Werner. Mischke. Okay. And he, okay. I know he sounds German. I think he was born here, but he's, he comes from German fam, family. And he deals, okay. he's a, there's also called a shame on a, uh, what's the name of that? I get, I get from them every, every week. I get an email, shame on a, shame and on a, uh, there's some sort of conference or group that look into this stuff and, and interpreting it for the West. Brilliant stuff. Very, very, very useful. Very useful indeed. Wow. Wow. That's great. This is really, really great stuff. So in terms of some of the major paradigms we see today or methodological approaches to perpetuating the Jesus movement, uh, we have various facets of attempts to do church, if you want to call it that, uh, or to be the church. And we have uh, the missiological, I'm sorry, the missional approach, the apostolic missional approach. Um, we have an attractional model. I have another term I'll use called the branding model. Um, can you speak to the difference between the typical attractional model of the church and the New Testament missional model? Yeah, if I uh, can, uh, let me just go back to... Um... To, to maybe help us yeah, go back to that thing about cultural distance um, and play that out a little bit more. Uh, when I said that most of us, you know, we, here's our church here. Not, um, what we can, oh, that's a very bad, I'm using my finger. <laughs> uh, can imagine here, like there's a guy called Hamid. Uh, Hamid is his name uh, it's on is that he's, he's a Muslim man and let's play that Hamid actually is a second generation Muslim. He's not particularly religious, but being a Muslim, the family bonds are very strong and the sense of identity is very strong. He lives, you know, somewhere in America. And here's a guy called Jack over here who works alongside Hamid and Jack happens to be a very good evangelist. He, you know, he, he's able to win Hamid's heart and he shares the gospel with him. And Hamid gives his heart to the Lord. Uh, the natural next step in the, the standard equation, I think most people will say, is what's, what, what happens next? Well, 
we take Hamid to church, don't we? And let's say this is a particularly good church. It, uh, it assimilates people very, very well. And uh, so, he's, you know, he's welcomed in. He's, you know, he feels, you know, immediately celebrated. He's put into uh, someone to nurture him. He's in the cell group. He's, you know, he's, pro he's properly assimilated. It's good, good church, right? And uh, he's a single man and he, he might very well meet his future wife now, you know. So he's got a really rich fellowship experience. Uh, the problem, yeah, so, so that's all good. The problem is that he becomes churched as a result. Now we know, and this is very old statistics, but, but I think it's probably worse now, but, but uh, we know that, that within three to five years of a person becoming a believer, they will no longer have any meaningful relationship with those outside the church. All their meaningful relationships now are in the church. And you, you know, because the church is doing its job well. And that does, it feels so right. Here's the problem with it, is that by attracting, we, we talk about this as being attractional. That is the idea is that expectation is people come to the church in order to be fed, nurtured, and, 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 and you know, nourished. Uh, the problem is with that, it's fine when you're operating within the M0, M1 framework. No problemo. The problem is when you take people from out further contexts, you effectively break the connection that they have with their host communities and therefore snap the connection of how the gospel might spread. Uh, and this is disaster in, in the missionary setting. So in effect, by acting attractionally, that is expecting people to come to us, uh, we effectively extract them from their context. And like I said, in missional terms, it's, that's a disaster because it becomes a, 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 an enclave in itself very quickly because this is getting smaller. And it means that we're not learning. And here's the other big challenge. Who's the one who has to do the cross-cultural work to go to church? Is Hamid, right? And if any of us listening here doubt that, why don't you visit a mosque this Friday and see how you feel? Uh, you know, if you don't know what you're doing there and, and what, what everyone means when they talk about things and you know? because that's what we're expecting outsiders to do on, on our turf. Who are the missionary ones? Who's the sent ones of, of God's people? As the Father sent me, so I'll send you. We're the sent ones, right? So we're the ones meant to go to them, not them come to us. And so this, again, uh, it relates, as you're saying, Joseph, to, the, to this challenge between methodology. You know, we, the methodology that, that worked well over here is letting us down over here. And we need to learn how to engage on the missionary ground. And, and this now in the Western world, as, which is the missional church model. So missional church is, a, is the form of church that takes a mission as its organizing principle. And it's, it allows that to determine how it expresses its life and its forms and its culture. Uh, it allows the mission of God to determine that. So we say that missiology predetermines and shapes ecclesiology, not the other way around. Yes. And if our focus is getting people in a building, that is to say, attractional model, yes. how does that either help or dissuade against making disciples and making a movement? Yeah, well, that's an, so a similar kind of issue. Again, it's, it's one of the bugs uh, in our... Um, in our software, again, that our inherited understandings, um, I think uh, has to do with the way we do church. Um, so the standard form, let me go to traditional form at first, um, which is shaped like this. And then what you've got here really is basically someone up front and who's done all the training. And most people in a traditional church uh, are passive. Now you do have a, a you know, a diaconate or elders or whatever it is. So, so let's say there's like 5% of people active in the church or in the ministry, but that leaves 95% of people pretty darn passive as receivers of, of information. And this of course is that academic Greek thing again too, because it's usually passed on in a, in a monologue uh, that goes for about 40 minutes, right? That sermon and a bit of formation in, 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 in the church itself. And the, the, so God uses this. I'm just saying there's a bug in the system. The more current model, which is what we call contemporary church, 
uh, looks like this. And it's pretty much become predominant in certainly in our circles. Uh, um, is really what you've got now is the same basic model, uh, effectively. Um, really, it's the same model, but it's got wings on it, right? So it's just more elaborated. Uh, one of the fathers of church growth theory, uh, where this all came from, is a guy called Eddie Gibbs, and he's the British guy, and he says, it, instead of the, the church growth model, he said, oh, it's a pig with lipstick, but it's still a pig. <laughs> and what he wasn't, he wasn't trying to be insulting. He was just like saying it's a pig with lipstick. It's, that's what it is. But here's the deal. Uh, let's say it does its job really well. And it, you know, it, it's enabled to get about 15% 15 pe 15 of people active. Because you've got to have a lot more people in cell groups and all that stuff. And it, the, you know, the big church is able to do that. But it leaves 85% of people pretty passive, doesn't it? Um, in fact, now, not only are they passive, you've entertained them. And, and, you, and, and, the, and what you win them with, and this is the danger of, of this kind of model, what you win them with, you win them too. Because the social contract is come and be entertained. And then the problem is next week, you've got to do it better than the week after. And when Sexy Hillsong comes down the road, everyone bleaches out because all you've done now is you've created a whole lot of passivity of people who really are an audience, not a church. They're there receiving, eating the goodies that you're handing out. And you're actually making consumers out of them. But the problem is, why is this goes to your question of discipleship? The problem is that consumerism is probably the biggest alternative religion in our day to, to, the, to, 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 the, to, to Christianity. And why do I say that? It's because consumerism offers meaning, identity, purpose, and belonging. And that's what religion offers. So when people buy certain brands to identify themselves with other people, you know, Nike or whatever it is, or uh, they buy products to find meaning in their life, these things are religious quests. Remember about the keys, right? These are people are looking for religion in the wrong places. And I would argue that consumerism is very, very effective religion. And people being discipled every day by marketing, and by repetitive actions in their lives, which confirm the, the, this predilection for, for, uh, for uh, consumption. And so I think that's the biggest issue we have, and it's killing the church. Yes, and so looking at the ethos of the New Testament, Jesus talked about the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve Just, yeah. and give his life a ransom for many. And then he told his followers to take up the cross yeah. and follow him um, and Jesus was exemplified even in the writings of Paul in Philippians chapter 2 for example the model of Jesus who was of no reputation but took upon himself the form of a servant or a slave yeah. Yeah. was something to be emulated I don't yeah. see that celebrated no. in the Western church so no. how does the consumeristic attractional model go along with the New Testament pattern of servanthood uh, well, you know, uh, yeah, we follow much more celebrity, celebrity based stuff. I gotta be honest, uh, uh, I find it very difficult. Um, um, partly because Australians are likely to do the opposite than Americans. I mean, if, if anything, quite honestly, it's quite, there's an ungodly uh, crushing of people's efforts. So, you know, we, we call it the tall pot, poppy syndrome, this idea of everyone's level and, you know, no one can emerge from the, from the crowd or the group. Uh, and it's part of, kind of the pathology, I think, that is in, in, in many Australian, in, in Australian culture in general. In America, it seems to go the other way around. Uh, and people tend to uh, invest a huge amounts into the celebrity, uh, the celebrity person, who's just a human being, by the way. And then when they begin to believe their own press and exploit that, uh, become really very dangerous people. who Actually, I believe are robbing the glory of, of Jesus that belongs to Jesus alone, right? So the, they're not, you know, they're stealing from Jesus what belongs to him, in my opinion. That's the problem of celebrity. It's basically a false form of worship, trying to find meaning and purpose in things other than God. And I think that is really a big, big problem, and big problem in charismatic circles. So we've got these, you know, I think it's a huge problem. It plays on celebrity all the time. Yeah, and so if someone's coming to church to be entertained, that feeds into the, the consumeristic yeah. Yeah. culture. 
mm-hmm. hedonistic culture, if you will, that could even be called Hellenistic to a point. Um, and so you have this consumeristic underpinning of coming to church for yeah. uh, you to know, get your something. own self, and it breeds a, a yeah. sort of narcissism in the church, and mm. it's antithetical to the whole essence of the gospel of making yeah. disciples who yeah. will, they were called witnesses, and that's where we get the word martyr, the word martyr, mm. giving yeah. you life for mm-hmm. the cause. It, mm-hmm. It's antithetical to the whole culture of the gospel. Mm. And then, of course, it's interesting that, you know, like in the few times, I, I actually do church consultants on occasions, but uh, often I would get this phrase, um, oh, we're a great commission church. And I say, well, no, really? Okay, so what does that mean? Oh, well, you know, we, we, uh, we, we evangelize, right? So we believe in the gospel. And I say, oh, okay. Well, and then I said, let's read the great commission. Um, and so, so, well, you know, Jesus is just about to send to the Father, right? Just a kind of very poignant moment. Uh, they're worshiping him. And he says, go out into all the world and make disciples of the nations, right? Not, con- not, not just choices of people who make a decision, but disciples of the nations, teaching them to obey, which is the discipleship agenda. Uh, yes, you baptize them into the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And I'm with you always. I've got your back. Uh, off you go. Go and do it. Get, get it done, right? And the problem is that I say to my friends, I say, where do you see evangelism there? Exactly. And they say, oh, because you know, they're Great Commission churches, right? So I say, well, where do you see evangelism there? And I would argue that what we've, the mistake we've done here is we've, we've, we, we've, we've substituted evangelism and a decision for Jesus in a church service often for discipleship. And I believe we need to flip, the, flip it around. We need to reframe evangelism within the greater context of discipleship and disciple making. Evangelism happens within the context of what well, we're going to up and make disciples of, of, of the nations. And, and, you know, I think it, it'll happen much better in that context. Otherwise, so I was saying here is that the, I think the way we're doing evangelism, evangelism is undermining the success of, uh, of the church in making disciples. Right. We're not doing life with the people. No. We're just getting them to make a decision. Make a decision. And, and, and the assumption is, we, you know, we've got a tap somewhere that we can just turn salvation on. And I'm afraid I don't think we do. I, I mean, I, we, can, we can proclaim the promises of God, but it's God's work to regenerate the human soul. It's not something I can turn on on every Sunday. You know, I think it's a mistake. And it's Gnostic and it's dangerous. And it's undermined it's, you know, our methodology in making disciples, which is a very dangerous thing. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's a big issue. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I, I always love uh, reading about the methodology of St. Patrick and the Celtic model for evangelism, where they would actually plant a church movement or a Jesus community in a city or, or another culture. Yeah. And they'll do life with them. They'll embrace yeah. them. Yeah. They'll, lo- yeah. they'll let them love them and yeah. know them. And, and uh, in the context of their faithful presence in that city in that context will people come to know jesus as opposed to just going on the street corner preaching drawing a line in the sand and the first step in the roman way of of evangelism is presentation then they receive christ that's number two and then number three is we embrace them as opposed to the celtic model they embrace them first yeah then Yes, they got to know Jesus. Can you yes. speak to that model? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, that I think goes along with this this idea of uh, uh, the Celts were actually more consistent, say, with the early church model on this, which we call pre pre and post conversion discipleship. Uh, so, for instance, Joseph. So, like, if the two of us were neighbors, bro, and in Rome, and let's say this is year one hundred and twenty, well, you know, whatever, just pick pick a year, um, and. Uh, you can play the Christian, I'll play the bad guy. So I'm, let's say I was in the, the Roman army, raping and pillaging my way through the Roman Empire. And, um, and, and so I've come home, I've got my, more or less my limbs intact. I, you know, I'm uh, basically a mercenary, so I've got a bit of money, uh, I can now retire. But at night time now, I've got a lot of nightmares. I've done some very, very bad things. And my unconscious has come to haunt me. And so I'm not, not a happy man. As what you, you know, God is on work in my case here. Yeah. 
Now, I know you are, you know, something about you that attracts me. I find out that you actually are a Christian. Uh, so what would be the, you know, now you can't take me to the community. Uh, you can't take me to church because, well, I'm a mercenary and, uh, and there's a price on your head. Uh, I can dob you in and get, the, pro and get the, the reward. So you can't simply take me to church. And you're not allowed in their tradition to, to share the gospel with me. So eventually what will happen is you'll check me out, bro, and then we'll, you know, we'll, uh, we'll say, I think he's ready. You'll blindfold me and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll take me to meet the elders, right? So whoever the elders are, I'll come before the elders and they will examine me. And it is pretty thorough questioning of my life and my motivations and what I think and my worldview. And they say, whoo, 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 he's a pretty bad dude. Right? No. He's going to do two years catechisms. Now, this is what we call catechism, right? Uh, two years catechisms, bring him back in two years time. Right? So now catechism, this is interesting. It's not the way we've done it. We think of catechism as trying to indoctrinate people into the, and I mean that in a good way, you know, helping people, heads of doctrine. Uh, you know, if you've come from a mainline church, you'd, you'd, you'd recognize me. Uh, but this is not that. This is built on the Sermon on the Mount. So all the catechisms that go back to second, third century, really basically expositions of the life of Jesus, based primarily on the Sermon on the Mount. So, you and I are going to meet regularly together and you're going to coach me on the basis of the Sermon on the Mount. Well, that's a pretty high ethic, right? That's a pretty high bar. And we, we're going to learn this together. Two years later, I get to go, and if I'm still around, <laughs> you're going to take me to meet the elders again, right? So if I go blindfolded, I have to meet the elders, oh, they, and they examine me again. Right? Yeah. Mm, I think he's ready. And now, now they will proclaim the gospel to me. Uh, and it goes like this, you know, when you renounce the devil in all his ways, I do. You accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, I do. I get naked, get into the baptismal waters, I come out, they put a white gown on me, and they present me to the people of God as a neophyte, a new, a newborn brother or person in the faith. Now, that isn't seeker sensitive practice, is it? Mm -mm. No, sir. You're going to make it very hard for me to join church. I can lose my life for it. But here's the deal. That church, that, that church that was around 100 to, and the start, this is New Testament too. Jesus says you should die to your own agenda first, right? So the, 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 the church of the first three centuries, uh, in, it was much harder. They raised the bar in discipleship, lowered the bar in church. Church is a reasonably simple affair, um, and they're going to make it hard. But what they've got now is disciples, not consumers, right? And with, on disciples, you can build just, a, or Jesus can build anything. And I, I have a phrase that Jesus can uh, do more with 12 disciples than he can do with 12,000 consumers, you know, so. Yeah, as we read the book of Acts, it even tells us in Acts chapter 5 that nobody dared join the church. Uh, it was a closed meeting. People were not allowed to come in and, uh, unless there was some kind of process first. And so the way we're thinking about church today yeah. is totally yeah. different. It's, it's yeah. amazing, huh? Yeah. It's not like everything, I don't know what people get the feeling that we've always done it wrong, but just because we're not self-aware about these things, we, we, we've, we assume that it's right. And, and, and the problem is that I think a lot of those assumptions are getting us into trouble. Most people don't reflect deeply about uh, their own culture, their own language, uh, the assumptions that they bring to the world until you maybe cross a culture, you just assume that everything you do is correct. And, but there are better ways of doing these things and ways that are more faithful and would take less effort and have achieved more results. We just have to be much more self-critical in a good sense of the word, because we want to do it better. We want to do a better job, you know, in Jesus name you know, and for his glory. One of the amazing things too, when you look at the book of Acts, even the gospels, most of the activity was done outside of a building. Yes. And so right now we're depending on the pastor to preach a rhetorical message with right. orator, you know, oratory, great oratory, get people saved. Uh, and the only job the church member has is just trying to get that person in the building on yeah. Sunday. And then the pastor will do the rest. And then the trained altar workers will do the rest yeah. as opposed to the new Testament model where before yeah, right. they even came at the church, they were already saved. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And like, you know, church wasn't something, um, um, 
that was just a, a, an event. I mean, there was, it was part of the ritual cycle that they'd meet once a week. But, but church was a phenomenon that extended into the whole of their week. Uh, I like this. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but actually the word ecclesia, you, you probably would know, uh, the, which we get our word church from, uh, the called out ones. Um, it has some, the way the New Testament used it, some, definitely some Old Testament roots, but primarily it was a Greek uh, word um, that came out of Greek society. And uh, in uh, the ecclesia in a city uh, was the council of elders that meets uh, once a week on a Saturday morning at the gates of the city. And th- they were the elected, that's where, where you know, uh, the elected individuals, the called ones, uh, they were really the city council. Uh, they would meet together to resolve problems of the community, right? So they were the elders of the community. And so people would come saying, there's a widow that needs some food and they would provide food or if someone's got a dispute, they would help resolve the dispute. So they were really there, and here's the phrase, that they existed there for the benefit of the city. Now, Paul, when he uses this word, which is a really, all the Bible, all the Bible, you know, New Testament writers use the word. Uh, it does have, you know, connections with the Old Testament, but that's the primary concept, that the church exists for the benefit of the city. It's not for its own benefit. The church is the one society on earth that exists for the benefit of the non-members. Um, Karl Barth said that, and it's a very useful kind of phrase. But I think that's implied in the very idea of ecclesia, or ecclesia, uh, uh, that we, we don't just exist for ourselves. And I think Paul's very clever, because he could use the word synagogue or synagogue or gathering. Or, there were other words. He uses the primary word is, is ecclesia, and I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting play on things. All right, and that's the first word that Jesus used in Matthew 16. That's right. To depict his, his followers. So that's the seminal word that should yes. frame the missiological understanding yeah. and nature of the church. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's really, really important. We've gone from the ecclesia to the episynagoga and basically, uh, you know, trying to get people to gather, but the ecclesia implies a purposeful gathering yeah. to yeah. serve, to lead. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 and notions of we're the called ones that God has called us into this. And therefore, and by the way, in the Bible, every calling, you know, uh, issues in an activity. In other words, every summons is ascending. Uh, you, anyone that comes before God or the throne is actually sent out afterwards with something to do. And so, uh, so even implied in the idea of the called out ones, the, the ecclesia, the, you know, there is this notion of purpose and functionality and blessing to the world, you know. Yeah, so the nature of the church uh, taken upon itself, the nature of Jesus, who didn't come to be served, but to serve, yes. would be the church gathered is to be the church scattered. Yes. We should be coming in the church place to be equipped in the workplace. There should never be a bifurcation yes. between sacred and secular, between yes. religious, irreligious. There should be somebody who's doing life in the city. Yeah who's mimicking Christ and extending the church wherever they are, correct? I think the best way to think about that is Jesus is Lord, not just of the church, so not just of the Sunday, but Jesus is Lord over every dimension of your life. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, there is no sacred secular in a biblical worldview. There's only the holy and the not yet holy. And our job is to make it holy by holy actions, redemptive actions in the name of God. Uh, that bring and redirect the world to, you know, to its source and restore it and reframe it. So just shifting gears a minute here, um, you're also and have been embracing the apostolic paradigm in functionality. We're not talking about title. We're not talking about, about hierarchies. We're talking about in function. So how does the missional apostolic paradigm embracing the five functions of the ministry gifts of christ how does that affect and challenge the present pastoral paradigm of the church well, what are yeah. the implications so yeah i mean the implications is that we you know early on in the piece and this uh, you know you've tracked some of it uh back to those early days uh i see you know that one of the big early church fathers uh um who i think is 
to blame for a lot of our rejection of the APEST uh, dynamic, I call it APEST or fivefold, uh, possible property managers, shepherd. I use the word shepherd because it's, and there's a better translation than pastor, but, uh, teacher. Um, uh, was a guy called Clement of Alexandria, and the church was under attack at the time and under, you know, perceived heresy. And he circled the wagons and uh, he basically uh, opted for what they call the Bishop, Bishop, Priest, and Deacon model, you know, in, as the soul. And, and he saw that in terms of structure and it attached to the papal system as well, what was developing the papal system at the time. And, but, but in doing so, he opted against the APEST model, which, you know, uh, was more disturbing to him because you had a whole lot of people moving around and doing things that he couldn't control. And the problem is that, you know, he, he then, I think, set the agenda. Well, not only him, but there were other forces, but they basically locked the APE, Apostle Prophet Evangelist, out of the equation leaving the church with, I think, a fatal flaw in its ministry, uh, that it is built primarily on the idea of the shepherd or the pastor and the teacher or the theologian. And to be honest, primarily the theologian in the Western tradition. Um, we've not been known to be the most caring people, of, or, you know, generally. We, we, but we, at least Protestants, at least, uh, are very strong on doctrine, right? It's very important. So we really are teaching community. The problem is it's undermined our capacity to be the body of Christ. Uh, in fact, Paul in Ephesians 4 links the fivefold with fullness of Christ. Hello, fullness of Christ. He also uses the word mature a couple of times, two times there. Mature is teleos, that is complete, perfect, uh, uh, perfected, um, mature. Everything that Jesus intends for us, so that it's what we use twice, is attached to apis. And he also uses this word catechisma, which we, 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 we tend to opt for the idea of like equip. And there's nothing wrong with that. This is one possible example. But there's, there's about seven ways of equally translating that term, catechisma. Uh, it could mean to repair and to restore, which is interesting, right? To restore God's people for works of service. That's different, right? That's a servant mentality coming out, yes. To restore, to repair, to make complete to uh to make whole and the old king james used the word to perfect um to perfect god people god's people for works of service well that's that's a lot of stuff built into apis there alone that should make us kind of correct these things so yeah most churches in the at least the uh you know in the evangelical heritage but i would say the mainline protestants including catholics have locked this out and i think it's undermined our capacity to be the church that jesus intended us to be yeah, well, that's powerful. Um, so yeah, you know that I'm leading some called the United States Coalition of Epstock Leaders. Uh, its roots were in something called ICA, the International Coalition of Apostles. Uh, when I was asked to lead U.S., I told them I could only lead it if we changed the name from ICA to ICAL. That is to say, apostle had to be made an adjective or a function yes, rather absolutely. than a title. Yeah, because I don't call myself an apostle and yep. I don't want to deal with qualifying what apostle is everywhere I yep. go. And I feel like that's helped marginalize the movement in terms of uh, yep. the larger evangelical world. Yep. So since me and you've met, we've had some dialogue. You've read some of my stuff. I've read some of your stuff. What do you think the potential is now for the ICAL, US Cal? you know some of the direction I'm, I'm taking this national thing and John Kelly's totally with me and I'm with him in terms of where ICAL needs to be uh, heading. Uh, do you see, uh, what is the possibility here of seeing some kind of convergence with this larger evangelical missional mm -hmm. model? Because under certain leaders, we've definitely been limited and marginalized and I don't want to get into that now, but what do you look at some of, how do you see some of these possibilities? I don't know. I, I'm yeah. pretty excited about it. Yeah. Well, I think the whole thing about the, the, the fivefold, in, uh, I, I work largely, as you've indicated, probably in broad evangelical circles, but cross over to Catholics as well, and then uh, with Pentecostal too. So broadly, you know, that kind of group of people. And so I think the fivefold is, is cracking it. I mean, really cracking it in, I mean, in from Baptists all the way through to Salvation Army, through to Wesleyan, to the Methodists. Um, this is just, 
cracking open at the moment. It's very, very exciting. Because it's the first time in thousands of years that the church is beginning to take this stuff very seriously. And because it promises wholeness and healing and all that stuff I mentioned, I believe it's, uh, we, we're seeing something very, very significant. At the same time, uh, and I, 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 I agree totally with you, uh, Bishop, that, that, you know, we, that I think where, when, where, this, where this language has been used, uh, being in charismatic Pentecostal circles, I think it is distorted into being a title and about power and authority rather than being a function. And I think it's a huge mistake. And I just would say that, I mean, people say to me, oh, a, you know, Paul never uses the word uh, as a title ever. The only one who gets the titles in the Bible is, is Jesus, right? That's uh, right. I mean, and you say, well, the Apostle Paul. Yeah, actually, Paul never says Apostle Paul. He says Paul and Apostle. Uh, it's never done in front of the name. It's always after the name, which actually indicates function. But be as it may. I think there's a wonderful opportunity for us to begin to inform each other with different experiences and perspectives. And I, I hope that if something, you know, part of what we you know, do together would, you know, to be to bring, bring some healing in the church in this regard. Yeah, I'm, I'm starting to have a lot of dialogue with people representing Lausanne, representing certain yeah. evangelical universities. I'm launching an institute that you'll be a part of as well, and that'll be certified with, uh, you know, a university like ORU and maybe some others. So we're starting to see, uh, as we have rejected some of the anomalies, uh, some of the pioneers of the last 60 years in the apostolic and been more mainstream and I think more biblical. Like you said, you know, we, we're not using apostle as a title. If someone wants to call them that, themselves that, that's fine. But we're looking at it as Paul and apostle, an adjective, yeah. a function. Yeah. Yeah. As we begin it's to embrace it that way. Uh, and I would say that the same should be of all titles. You know, we should be very wary of them. Jesus warned us about that stuff. He did. Right. I mean, he called no man father and, you know, half the world's Christians call it, you know, it just... Uh, this, this, I mean, it sets up differentials that can be very tricky, you know, among God's people, you know? Yeah. So I just think we should be very wary about titles in general. Well, I couldn't agree more in hierarchy and politics in mm. the church. Yeah. Uh, one man said to me, should a Christian be involved in politics? And I laughed at him. I said, well, there's more politics in the church than there is in the world. So <laughs> I said, we should be the experts. Yeah. Um, but, um, I'm excited over the convergence. I'm excited over meeting someone like yourself. Uh, I'm excited with uh, how God is unifying his church. And I'm excited that the apostolic paradigm is is not going to, some people are afraid when we say we're coming into an apostolic paradigm, they actually think we're talking about overthrowing pastors or by force, you know, taking over churches and denominations. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the opposite. We're talking about, buffering, uh, yes. uh, helping, aiding yes. by modeling uh, what, what church should be. We're hoping that by people just getting vision and mission in their soul, that they're going to adopt yeah. a New Testament pattern. We're not talking about any usurping of authority. Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting. So I, I've more and more now to say we need fivefold, not onefold. Uh, at least fivefold. You want 20, fine. I mean, if you can handle it, but at least fivefold to be biblical. And, uh, and, in a sense, we all are counterbalances to the other. So, you know, the, 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 the shepherd would counterbalance some of the energies of the, in a good way, the, the, the apostolic, you know, in the name of a healthy community, so you're not just kind of killing us. Uh, you know, we each need each other to be ourselves. And, uh, and I think that's something we need to grapple with. And just, uh, just for the sake of it, um, I mean, my most, my, my most recent book is this book called 5Q, which hints at that, right, the idea of IQ, 5Q, so it tries to kind of do an index on, on churches in terms of 5Q and looking at the organization, not just as individuals. And this one over here called the Permanent Revolution uh, is more a focus on the fivefold as well the apostolic in the context of the fivefold. So also a challenge for apostolic folk, which I think we need to explore and what does it look like, but to, to see that only always ever in the context of the other four gifts which hold it in a dynamic association in the body. Well, this has been great, Alan. And uh, me and you are going to meet again in a few minutes to do uh, something for the Institute. Um, 
but I want to remind everybody that this is a U.S. Cal roundtable. You're interested in joining U.S. Cal. It's a a group of, of, of leaders that are interested in seeing an apostolic paradigm restored back to the church, both in the workplace and marketplace. You go to uscal.us. We do have another um, another um, roundtable, September 24th. That's a Monday, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time that'll go on the website. And it's going to be on stressors and pressures of the apostolic leader. And the presenters are Jim Gallo and Buford Lipscomb. So that's going to be September 24th, Monday, September 24th, 2 p.m. Stressors and pressures of the apostolic leader. I also want to let you know, uh, again, go to uscal.us. There's an iCal gathering, November 5th to the 8th in Dallas. And again, our annual bridge summit is June 10th to the 12th. And so uh, you could uh, get in touch with us through uscal.us and get in touch with me by emailing assistant at josephmatera.org, assistant at josephmatera.org. And uh, we will uh, do whatever we can to help facilitate uh, this movement, this large movement that has taken place across the world. The largest expression of the growing church and body of Christ right now is the apostolic movement. And uh, I want to give my thanks to Alan for just, just taking this time. He's very, very busy. Um, just a brilliant man, a brilliant missiologist, brilliant consultant, thinker and practitioner, translocal practitioner. Thank God that uh, we're working together and we're going to just see some great, great things happen uh, globally as we see more of these kind of dialogues. And uh, those of you in U.S. Cal uh, who are viewing this, and I know hundreds of others will view this, maybe thousands, when we post this on YouTube and uh, social media. I want to encourage you to get Alan Hirsch's books. He's written 12 books and I read one of his books and I'll tell you, it's just fascinating read. Uh, I highly endorse everything he writes. And that's it. We're going to close in prayer. Thank you so much, Alan. And uh, thank you for everybody for joining. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your church. You gave your life for the church and you said the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. We thank you, God, that you're restoring the way of Christ and his apostles, as Roland uh, wrote. Um, and uh, we thank you, God, that Roland Allen, uh, almost 100 years ago, was able to sense what you were doing today. We thank you, God, that the Ephesians 4 church is coming forth. Thank you, God, that every model of the church is being affected by this and that soon there will not be a delineation between Pentecostal, charismatic, and evangelical and fundamentalist, mm. that we're going to be one. And even the Jesus people in every denomination, whether it's the Roman Catholic, uh, whether it's the Orthodox, whether it's the Anglican, whether it's any of the uh, thousands of denominations representing Protestantism, we thank you, God, that there is a oneness that's coming forth and that you're going to use the apostolic movement to help bring that unity as that is part of the call to convene, as they did in Acts 15, and to bring the Apostles' Doctrine, the way of Christ, back into the forefront. We thank you, God, for Alan. We pray for his physical health, his mental uh, acumen, uh, his ability to write. God, we do pray for even more clarity, more insight, more illumination. Father, that he will write every book that he's called to write, he will travel to every place. He will meet every person and he will impact every movement that he's supposed to impact before he goes to be with you. And we thank you, God, for long life in his life and for this whole movement, U.S. Cal and I Cal. Thank you to you. Be the praise and the glory in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you all. We love you. and We'll talk to you all soon. Thank you very much.